Okay. Hello, everybody. Welcome to tonight's episode of the live stream. Feel free to engage the live stream if you're interested. If not, I, I will carry on the discussion. So the title of tonight's episode is Moral Inspirations of Future Generations, you know. And so the theme is universal tolerance. And so why is universal tolerance is needed? What sort of, in, what will inspire the children of our children's children? And what is morality at its core? How does the notion of what is right and wrong evolve for our species as, as the years come? So you see, you got to first look at the human being, and then you'll immediately access the data of your observance. And for me personally, what I've noticed is that we human beings uh, do not just function in a system, in a system that's primarily biological, but we also create systems and we live through the change of these systems of intelligence. That means when you look at yourself, you are being intelligent compared to you, let's say, like 10 years ago, 15 years ago, you're using different sorts of intelligence. Your intelligence has opened up in new ways. Now, the sense of right and wrong, it's one of those puzzles for our species, which is very easy to solve in my view, but of course, nothing is easy. The religious morality believes in a code of ethics handed down from a divine position. So pretty much there is certain people who are justifying what is good and bad based on the majors, um, the fundamental story they're using. Okay. Now, I find because we're creatures that work with a sort of system of experience, that means we go through an experience and then we update. We go through an experience and then things update. The mind then constantly re-sculpts itself based on the new data that comes to it. Eventually, after through living, like you living your life, you begin to see what seems to you as efficient and what seems to you as inefficient. And I find that the civilization advances when it can distinguish what is efficient and what is inefficient. So in some sense, one task of trying to, in some sense, allow a new global mind to emerge and a new global community of interest to emerge is to first recognize what is the efficiency uh, of the group. Why does the group want to form? The group tends to form because it can do something that the individual can't. So whenever people saw they could do something that involves others, they in some sense the action was beyond a uh, one person. The efforts of the many were was needed. So the future generations are going to open their eyes and they're going to look at the kind of world we've left behind for them. And based on how that world treats them, they're going to learn ways of treating the world. If I was born a thousand years ago, I would have totally different conclusions on reality. If I was born anywhere else, I would have totally different conclusions. But you see, pretty much we're all looking at a system and how it moves. And that's, that's what occurs. That means all those people who, in some sense, have, have, have considered themselves doing practices that are meditative, eventually... You know, let's say like this, you, it, people who go towards spirituality, they're seeking the enlightenment of themselves. Those people who go towards the uh, kind of redlined engines of the ego in society, these people are seeking the enlightenment of the world. So there's two kinds of kind of goodwill moving on this planet. One is for the efficiency of the whole system. The other is the, for the efficiency of an individual. And when you get tired of selling fish, when you get tired of living selfishly, then new opportunities can emerge. You have to recognize this life is mainly about how your attention occupies the meaning of life. Okay, there has been moments where my attention has moved in a way where I could not shape it, I could not contain it. I, I tried to find words for it, I could not. 
I tried to give it a picture. I could not. And I realized it was an experience that commanded the breaking of the past. What is right and wrong has to do with the amount of care your nature has for the world. And that means pretty much human beings. They're either opening their eyes to the day, and they're either seeing the world that is, uh, they can work alongside, or a world they can't. If there are any inhibitions, if there are any sorts of beliefs that the world is lost and it's going to burn and it's a failed system, then you're not going to succeed because you have considered the failure has approached you first. Sometimes failure, the best thing you can do is see it as data and learn from it and go on. Because it's constant att attempts of intelligence. You see, when I give these talks, each of them is an attempt uh, for, for my knowledge to kind of extend. You see, it is, it, is, it is as if I am choosing to pick the brush and draw something I've never drawn before. That requires the freedom from the past because that space that is being occupied by your current attention that's on the past is actually the space that requires to consider the observances of the future. So you see, hey, the story you tell yourself is defining you and defining your morality. If you're a religious person, your story is obviously religious. You know, you, you work with those axioms and kind of uh, you have a certain axis of your subjective realm, you see. Philosophy, let's say science cares about the axis of the planet, of the outer world, in some sense, the world in front of your eyes. Philosophy cares about the axis of the world behind your eyes. And that axis is very malleable. That means thoughts come and go quicker than your body. That means you can say, let's say, one lifetime. The guy is born and the guy dies. Okay, that's one lifetime, let's say. Okay, so in that one lifetime, do you know how, do you know how many thoughts come and go? Do you know if this, if our mind was seen as some sort of, the brain was seen as some sort of biological antenna that in some sense translated objectivity into subjectivity and subjectivity into objectivity uh, and in some sense received various inspirations throughout the day, how would I say to you? It's like if your mind was an antenna, many thoughts that come and go don't belong to you. You're just receiving the signals of your environment. So the first step towards a sort of clarity that is going to be the cornerstone for the morality of the future generations is to kind of discover uh, what is your moral inspiration. Do you need, are you looking at a world where do you, you, you want the organizations that are in place to get efficient or do you, do you think the whole thing is inefficient and you know, like who cares about the world? Let's just uh, play our own game. I find the mentality of selfishness is boring. You know, when you live for yourself too long, you get bored and you eventually live for others. Do you see? So once you have personally satisfied the intelligence of your existence, you're going to seek an impersonal satisfaction. You're going to seek the perfection of the character uh, and the perfection of the character in the story. So, so right now, you're, you, who you are, let's say it's a sort of colored picture behind your eyes, how you have kept uh, the colors of existence uh, as the meaning of you in some sense. You see? For me, it's very fascinating. Right now, the moment we speak, we are entertaining the subjective realm. Without the consideration of subjectivity, it's like it's not that the guy's words don't make sense, it's that words don't make sense. Okay, words can become instantly hollow. You know, this is why I say in an emergency, uh, nobody is stupid. You know why? You know why? Because the emergency is such a physical instant need of a requirement to respond, the person snaps out of all the thoughts they have, you know. So I've, ha I've been in physical experiences where the physical aspect of it, how the moment was physically going forward, uh, was in some sense c creating a pain that I didn't have thought time to even think of the meaning behind the pain because the pain was the meaning in some sense. Okay, So we have to learn how to treat our objective reality, how to handle it, how to maintain it, and how to navigate it. And similarly, once the navigation of the objective existence is maintained, comes the navigation of the subjective existence. And that's 
that's what these talks are here for, you know. Uh, like these talks are not a talk, it's not a talk on like you going and being, for example, an athlete, you know. I, I am trying to inspire athletes for the mind because we seem to undervalue our free will in society and hence creativity is dying in front of our eyes. As if like imagine there's a battlefield and there is endless creative people wounded on this battlefield. You know, kind of a hacksaw ridge scenario where you have no weapon yet you see the value. And the moment that people stop caring for something is the moment where the death of millions can result. Okay, when you don't care about pushing a button, that button can be used for a nuclear bomb. And so the mind of man is very important because you have to ask yourself, what is worth preserving? What is worth living for? And most people conclude that it's their own ideas. Most people are living for their own ideas, you know, and in some sense we say, okay, if they didn't live for their idea, own ideas, what would they live for? And you would see it has to do with how each person has chosen to sit down and just like you grab a piece of empty piece of paper before you draw something or before you write something, you, you analyze how you have been analyzing reality and you analyze and you look at history and that's when knowledge becomes of value, when it can be useful. You seek what is useful subconsciously you just don't know it yet so either the inner reality evolves or the outer reality when the outer reality leads to a stasis it's not that the outer reality has not evolved it's that the energy that was fully outer now is divided between dimensions your subjective sense of being is moving in ways that your ancestors never could that means your mind is moving in ways that your ancestry could never even conceive because the world was not turning for them in that way. It is all about the value of an opportunity. Okay, think of it this way. Your eyes are open here for a little while. You're literally, this world you see yourself living in, you're here on this for a little while compared to how long existence has continued its manifestation process. I found it very peculiar and very interesting that many philosophers back in the day, even many poets, their mentalities arose from their profession. The guy was a blacksmith, so it was very easy for him to see how the gods crafted weapons for the gods. You see, the idea you entertain eventually begins echoing in deeper contexts that your memory holds. And your memory is not just your memory. It's as if like you have these two wings, but these wings are not physical wings. One of them is your deepest comprehension of the order the other is the deepest comprehension of the chaos one is how far you can look in the pitch blackness of existence and the other is how far you can see in the light that is shining the world into place so it's very important very important how we acknowledge our sense of self because the sense of self will then be a behavioral influencer of the world around it and the way the world changes will be the way our children open our their eyes to the world our children's children's children you know I am I am talking that for the first time we can administer our consciousness and it's no longer physical wars the phys the wars of physicality will end soon because they will all be internalized and once they're fully internalized it's as if we never have any single war on this planet again because resources can be used in smarter ways but if there is war it's as if like there would be a video game that the UN would have where the video game they would replicate the exact military potential of each nation so if two nations are going to war it's like with the simulations of their military it's all done in virtual reality and whatnot we, we in some sense solve our conflicts non-physically and that will be a very incredible moment because the moment violence stops on this planet, most people think, oh man, we're going to be bored. It's going to be this utopia. What's the point? We need to have a bit of chaos to be excited and all this stuff. But let me tell you what will happen. It's not that just because you get rid of violence, violence goes away. The same energy begins internally moving. And if people are smart, you know, they got to understand that if you do a good action or a bad action, an evil or good approach, regardless, you're doing an activity. You're, you're expressing energetically an activity. Okay, so this energetic expression can be in an efficient context, even though the concept might be inefficient. So what that means is the energy of evil is used for the better. 
that what is better is not per se good or bad. It, it transcends both notions. It, 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 it's, it's as if like some part, there's moments in life where you can define before. Like as I'm sitting right now, the world is happening. I'm present in this world. And based on how uh, my intelligence has in some sense become a system for itself, uh, I see the world in that system. Okay, and it's not always systematic because I've realized uh, this was the most biggest revelation. It shocked me. It was like I suddenly noticed something all my ancestry and everybody who had ever lived had not noticed. You know, that we are all seeking knowledge and we're seeking knowledge through language and it comes to us as a sort of belief, you know. We're trying to find, it's like we're trying to find the belief that will rule them all. You know, religious people feel they have found this belief. Scientific people feel that belief is unexplored. Agnostic people feel it's it's not there yet, you know. Some people believe that the truth is so beyond our eyes that our eyes can only follow it, you see. it's Sometimes it's a, it's a response to the existential situation uh, that's more important uh, the response to the existential situation kind of defines the experience. Okay, if you put your hand on a hot stove, you'll be like, holy shit, why is my hand here? And you'll like move your hand. <laughs> so similarly, you will find yourself in various moments in life where you will suddenly look at the data and the data will either come to you as some, it will either fit in your past, like you will be able to either identify a situation based because you've experienced something similar, or you will not be able to identify it. When you cannot identify the new, that's very interesting because that's the moment where the martial arts master is looking at his student and he says, forget everything I taught you, just go fight, right? That means allow your intelligence to apply itself. Let me tell you why there isn't that many creative people on this planet or people who think they're not creative. Because they don't know their intelligence. What you don't know, you can't be uh, assured of, you know. It's like something you haven't done, you don't know what, how it's going to be if you do it, right. So similarly, people don't know how they could be creative if they've never attempted to consciously extend a part of their world. That's the difference between art, guys. You see, there's a sort of... Uh, the artistic mind has a freedom in it that allows a world of creativity to emerge. You know, it's as if like you kind of look at it, okay, I was kind of created, you know. <laughs> you know, my parents, you know, they found each other and I came into being, you know. So it, there's this sort of process, the process of creation. So how can we not be creative? I debunked writer's block. I recognized writer's block is actually the writer's block. You know, the writer is blocking himself from other ways of perception. You know, because the, the per people feel their, stat their state of consciousness is fixed. You see, the brain is so chemically changing with every single movement that you can never even, uh, when you talk about the brain, it's never the same brain. It is, it is a new way of it, you see. And so this will eventually get many philosophers engaged in the notion of the essence and the surface. Okay, how like there's the surface of the water that has a certain value and then there is the depth of the water. And so when we talk about the ocean, can we just talk about the surface? Can we talk about only the depth? No, we have to include both. So we can no longer just talk objectively about truth and just consider that what's deep is subjective and beyond. You know, it's like it, it's all being kept in a grander way than our minds can still, uh, that cannot sculpt yet. Okay, this is the unknowable aspect of truth. And many people People won't share this. I, I, I naturally came into it. That's how my certainty is in the idea. But the, the notion is that the person who went to find truth looked at an ant. The person looked at an ant. And you know what that person saw when they looked at an ant? That person recognized, the, the person did not just notice the ant. The person realized how we could be ants. Okay. And some people even have a fear that in the year 2050 uh, and even beyond that, it, it's a AI, our computers can become smarter than we are and then we are no longer the deciding factor. That means our free will has to sit on the passenger seat if we create something smarter than us. So imagine being enslaved to your own creation. That is a savageness, you see. Uh, we human beings are sensitive creatures, internally speaking. Externally, you, you, can, you can stand like the mountain. Not from the Game of Thrones, guys. <laughs> I mean like an actual mountain. You could be present as nature. Every person has an ability to do this.
That means you don't have to have thoughts all the time. You don't have to have beliefs. Sometimes you can just watch the moment. That, that is where sacrament was acknowledged. That is, that's why the moment of revelation was so sacred. Because something entered your awareness that was not from you. Right? That was new. Okay? So the mind moves in many ways and the attention is creating uh, or, and the attention is defining that movement. So the study of attention becomes pretty much uh, the only path to enlightenment. Just study how your attention is being your moment. What else could there be? You, you, you seem to be an evolved, bewildered beast that has somehow evolved again to the sophistication of the civility of hu the human idea. Right, So it took us four billion years for the science project to generate the notion that there's humanity here. This ability to acknowledge the collective is, is our way. You see, let me, let me tell you guys, I understood this from nature. This is why I'm, I feel we will eventually inevitably be pulled that way. I, I call this an evo the ev like I'm, I've, I'm writing a book on this whole idea, uh, and it's called An Evolutionary Return to Nature. Okay, and so my notion in this book, what, what am I trying to say? I'm saying that human beings first separated themselves from the world. Then they made decisions that came across to them as mistakes. Then they became nostalgic about nature and just being free from the cycles of suffering. Okay, and eventually what happens, or, or what I feel will happen, is that we're going to recognize what we are, what, what is our highest technological ambition, is our highest viewpoint from nature. That means, let me tell you what technology is here to do. You, let me tell you why religions are continuing. Because technology is, is going to create heaven for them. People are going to be lost in the future in virtual reality simulations if they are not universally responsible. If their universe can just be a simulation, then they don't care. Okay? You have to build meaning similar to the notion of building paradise on earth rather than finding it or waiting to get in it. Okay? I, I find religion is the elevator approach to heaven. Okay? Do the right things and you'll be in the right elevator and you can go to heaven. Okay, I find it's, it's um, religion is not even being comprehended as religion was meant to because all of it was found in an awe of truth. You know, this is why in Islam, the Prophet looked as a hadith where he says, uh, the best generation is the generation after me. Uh, sorry, the best generation is my generation. Then after me, it's the other generations. And eventually, as the generations continue, man will become lesser and lesser. Okay, as if the religions were all saying, human beings, your problems, your problems are your solution. Okay, and your problems can only be conducted if there is a sort of faith to actually engage. So in some sense, uh, I, it's very funny, guys, you know, I, I see these words, such as the religious, uh, the secular, I see these two words, okay, and yet I see that every ideology fundamentally comes to attributeless design. So it's random shapes that suddenly have become objects in our mind. When I say this is a cup, this is just a unique atomic positioning of particles, okay, but I call it a cup, okay. And so that's how this object has become a cup is how your body is being a self, okay. Similar to I look at this cup and it doesn't have to be called a cup, but I call it a cup. You don't have to be called your name, but you're being called your name. Okay, and you begin to suddenly see the magnificence of the subtler multidimensionality at work as there's an aspect of intelligence that is observing the object and the, another aspect is the object observe. So one part of it, you're being, uh, uh, you're watching this world. In another way, you're part of the world that you're watching. You are the conscious engagement, the conscious involvement. So the future generations, we have to recognize, okay, let's, let's take this playful approach of first looking at a civilization as a sort of technological engine. This engine requires power. Okay, so this power will mean an empowerment of the future generations. How much the children of this world open their eyes and the future generations are, are empowered. They feel that as they engage the world, they become more, more than they are. Okay, if people feel, if they, society is, let me tell you, civilization is, 
is about to go extinct when people no longer want to be a part of it. You know, it has, it has been, corruption has infested uh, so many branches of the civilization that in some sense people don't want to even try. That's, that's, a, that's a death of civilization. And we're not there yet. <laughs> and I don't think we'll be there unless there's nuclear mistakes made. But I, but I feel we are on a point where we have to decide, and this is where the evolutionary return to nature comes in. We have to decide, when, we look, when you look at fish under the water, they move in groups. When you look at wolves in the forest, they move in groups. You see, for example, birds in the sky, they rhythmically all fly together in various wave patterns. Okay, and so this is very crucial because this, uh, like I remember there was a group of flies that was just moving and I was just in the park chilling watching these group of flies just fly above my head. It wasn't just above my head, it was just like in an area in front of me, right? And as I was watching these groups of flies, I suddenly got this funny idea. What if each individual fly is not itself? What if it's a field of intelligence that is, is so well organizing all of this? Okay, that means sometimes I've wondered about miracles and I thought, what if the miracle is the intelligence of a field, not an individual person, you know? Because when you see the model that there's a field of intelligence at work, then the individual life becomes a game, becomes a kind of act. You're an actor in the moment. You're an actor in the same way that your, the elemental forces have come to be you in the moment. That means it, it's very hard to feel that you're not made of this world when you, your eyes have opened in it. So the future generations must be empowered. They are as empowered as their minds are free. Just know this. This is something Mr. Within is saying. You are as free as your vision is. Okay? That means you could be the richest person, but if you've never left your mansion, your mind is not free. You can even, in some sense, be the richest person, but be the most tormented soul. Because the world was hidden from you in your lifetime. Right? So this is why fear is important, because fear is a suggestion of where you haven't explored yet. Okay, my approach to fear changed when I realized it's an opportunity for intelligence to apply itself regardless. Think of it this way. They say do 10,000 hours, okay, uh, and you will master life in some sense. Anything you do for 10,000 hours, you become a master at. Okay, so mastery comes from 10,000 hours of practice. If you practice writing 10,000 sentences, you can say you're a master of that craft. Master of writing sentences, for example. Okay, if you draw ten thousand paintings, then you can say you 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 have experienced moving the brush so many times that you have automatically attained mastery. You know what you're doing. Okay, <clears throat> and so I thought about it. How interesting. So if this ten thousand hours to become a master, a lot of human beings have lived over ten thousand hours. So you have lived ten thousand hours. Okay more than 10,000 hours, you have mastered physical form. But you will begin to see you can constantly add. So it becomes one of those things where the guy's like, my, my, my skill is like, it's not just, it, it's like infinity plus one, okay? In an infinite process, there is your individualness. It's very fascinating. This physical, it's like, well, I was like, okay, so many, so many, the secular mind that entertains that that worship that that in some sense uh, concludes evolution to be the only truth. What is, what is evolution when you really look at it? It is the eternal effort of a creature to survive. And so, are we really that shocked that people's minds went towards the supernatural and eternal? Evolution seems to be an infinite urge for continuity. So, evolution is like what is it? It's the mind of an animal who wants to continue living. Okay, so we will find a universal tolerance towards all ideology when we recognize many of us are in the same situation. Many of us are on a rock in the middle of nowhere. That's the first thing we have in common. For me, it's very easy. It's so easy to break something than build it. It's much harder to cultivate something than in some sense let it go. You know, it might take you many hours of work to suddenly be able to buy a product 
and then in an instant you can lose that product okay so you see civilization it's this thing that all our ancestors whether they knew it or not have been either directly or indirectly contributing so now is our turn now is our performance and so ask yourself if the whole world was watching you then what will you do then what would you say then what kind of person you would be if you were suddenly no longer dependent on external like data it, it, it's so fascinating it's kind of i'm going to steer this more towards mysticism now i'm going to tell you actually the story fascinating story the story of these three friends and it's a dervish story it's a sufi story and these three you know wise friends you know they're all good people in this story there's no bad person in the story uh so what happens in the story these three close friends you know they go and as they're walking they suddenly notice a mysterious wall and one of them says hey man did trump become president <laughs> And I'm joking. <laughs> the, these three friends, like this, the story is set like a thousand years ago in the Sufi tradition, you know, Sufi setting, you know. <laughs> but so how the story goes is that these friends, three friends are walking and suddenly they, they're walking near the edge of town and they see this gigantic wall. Just this wall that's just like this being giant wall that's covering all the edge of the town. And so it's very mysterious. This wall wasn't there. So these three friends are walking and eventually they see a ladder that goes up this wall. Okay. One of the three friends look at the, looks at the other two, and just with his eyes, the other two realize he's going to climb, and the friend climbs up, and these two are watching. As the friend climbs up, he gets on the top of the wall, and he just stands there on the wall, shocked, as if they just see their friend still in silence, as if what he's seeing is so mesmerizing, so, so beyond, that the friend has totally forgotten about the ladder and his two friends down there. He's just looking. And so they suddenly see this friend leap in. And they call his name and there's no response. Then the second friend is like, what is this? You know, and <laughs> the second friend goes up. The second friend goes up this ladder and eventually gets to the top, gets there and stands to see what's going on. And the second friend sees why the friend jumped in. Because the garden of paradise, as the story was, was, says, is, was there. He sees heaven. On the other side of that wall was heaven. Okay? Like the garden of paradise. Right? And so this, this friend, this second friend is like, oh my God. How could I not jump in? But he has this sort of moral, moral sense in him. He's like, gosh, the third friend's there. Maybe I should tell him something. So he looks at his, the third friend down the wall. And he says, hey, man, the garden of paradise is here. I'm jumping. The first friend's in there, too. You know, and he jumps. And so the third friend is like, the garden of paradise is on the other side of this wall. What? <laughs> and so the third friend walks. The, uh, the third friend climbs the ladder. Now, this is where the story gets fascinating. The third friend climbs the ladder and he feels his breathing becoming heavier. Not because he's a bit afraid of heights, but he goes up the ladder and he stands on the wall and his eyes open up and for a second he sees the garden of paradise he sees the heavenly state he gets the ultimate samadhi he sees truth that is the inner maha, maha samadhi when your mind finds truth before your body so your mind actually enters heaven before your body okay now i'm just entertaining this metaphysical notion but i'm uh, at the same time third friend so i'm going to get back to the story the third friend gets up the ladder looks at this and suddenly his hand goes on his over his head forehead and he doesn't know what to do and for a second he's about to jump in like one of his feet is on the air he's about to jump 
And suddenly, suddenly he stops. He stops and climbs down the ladder. And there's tears in his eyes. And the two friends are so busy, they've gone into the heavenly state. In some sense, they've transcended the suffering of the world. The third friend, actually even before he climbs down, as tears are coming from his eyes, he says, the garden of paradise is here. The whole world should know about it. And he, and he climbs down and he goes back into society and then he dwells in the mortal life. He still dwells in the mortal playground, the playgrounds of mortality. <clears throat> because trust me, all ideas of man are influenced by his mortality. And so is the notion of morality. How much you care for people is based on how temporary you feel. The less temporary you feel, the less you care about the world. Not the less you care about the world. You just don't, you, your attention is so on itself that it doesn't need to see anything else. Okay? Uh, if you do this uh, unconsciously in some sense, if you, the, the problem with desires is not the desire. It's not that it's bad to have things. The problem with the desire is that you're, you're, having, you're wanting that thing animalistically. That means there is a subconscious a movement of a, a devouring sensation behind, uh, in, in your experience. So trust me, you gotta, you know, it's like sometimes... Uh, angels and devils are not outside in the material world. They are in your mind where the idea has been an authorized existence. So many ideas come and go. For, for me, the ultimate conclusion was to realize you're not a thought. Okay? Like, I, I, I trust me, it was, it, was, it was like the most heartbreaking thing. It was the death of my, my ideological self in the mystery of how the, all it's the unknown presence of the universe that is moving all knowledge. You begin to see collective rhythms. You begin to see, imagine you open your eyes to a civilization that was working at such efficiency, at such advancement and clarity. That you, you just, you, that you had no time to be cruel, lazy, or anything because the world was getting to its destination. And its destination was just the effort to pursue, the effort to advance. As if that, that moment where a meteor was hitting the earth, the child looked at his father and it's like, Dad, what do I do? And the father looked at the son and he said, Son, stand as the strength of the world that you are and confront it, right? And even though the meteor hit, the child still stood its ground. And so your mind is, is, is very important because the way you clothe your body, like just like you wear clothes, you, you are clothing your mind through various ideology, imagery, and language. The moment your attention becomes free of this, which is an instant, you know, enlightenment was never, nobody ever said enlightenment takes like, like, like years to go meditate in a cave. That's nonsense. That is illusion. Illusion wants you to do something still in this world. It is only the non-elusive or in some sense, the, you, you got to understand truth is not something that can be given to you. It is how your eyes evolve. The evolution of your eyes is not the responsibility of the external world. And that's where you find your independence from. When your experience for the first time is your experience. Your experience suddenly bursts out having a value. You know, it's like, trust me, uh, so many people I hear there's an issue. It's like, it's crazy. Let me tell you what's going on. There's this kind of statistic that bullying has been increasing all around. Okay. Because there's more schools, so there's more bullying statistics. <laughs> but, <laughs> but in some sense, we can say human beings, um, as they came into tribes, they began oscillating from efficient ways. Their communities were functioning into in inefficient ways. When money and economy was birthed, as a concept on this planet, suddenly currency became important. People found something to look for. They stopped caring for people. They started caring for commodities. Okay. And that's, that's why in some sense you can, um, 
uh, that's why you can never do business with your friends because business is not a something where you should be emotional about you should be extremely rational okay that means a lot of negotiation is not done with a mutual trust first but done with mutual respect and then mutual trust arises from repetition of activity okay so I, I'm I, like the economy is another talk I gotta talk about the economy and how it's influencing the psychology of the value system of the moment okay um, so I'm trying to say it like this imagine we as a species concluded we concluded that um, just a second trying to find a nice song to listen to while I say this. <laughs> Imagine the civilization suddenly agreed. All this 8 billion people somehow, even though we speak different languages, even though we have different ways that we are expressed as intelligence, Imagine 8 billion people and growing suddenly agreed to this notion that because we are temporary beings, it is worth seeing what our greatest advanced efficient vision would be like as a civilization. So, so in some sense, Mr. Within is saying it is time for no, no longer people to get enlightened but for the greatest systems and the systems being used in all corners of this world to become enlightened. And what that means is you, you have to become a new observer. The task of the future generations is to, in some sense, unravel the unknown mysteries that the past generations wondered about. We should not just care about what we know. We should care about the unknown because it is the edge of what we know. Do you see? And we are we are not like you know. Uh, in certain anime shows, there's the notion of a warrior species. Okay, you know, a species designed just for war. That means all philosophies, all psychologies were based on war. But we are not a warrior species. We are an explorer species. An explorer species means that we are not here to be violent. But we start from violence because it is data that is needed to build the peace of the future generations. How fucked up, excuse my language, but how fucked up the world is right now is going to be what we need, we need to look at, look at to reverse engineer all that was messed up with the situation. Okay, so we in some sense need engineers and we need reverse engineers. Reverse engineers relate to, in some sense, an inner technology. Okay, uh, technology is very fascinating because it, it commands the need for a user. That means the god of the machine was the hand of man. So in some sense, when we f feel that we are the creation of the world, we feel we are the effect of an unknown cause, we're the known effect of an unknown cause, what will happen to existence? We see we either gave it a shot or we didn't. Okay, and this is not just a shot in a bar where you give someone, uh, you know, you know, a tequila shot. Yeah. <laughs> This is giving an uh, uh, allowing the total energy of the being to wonder about the greatest efficient contribution that they can give. So I am telling people, don't feel your lives are meaningless and you are, in some sense, ants, ants under a pebble. Uh, we, we have to, in some sense, build the world. Okay, and we built this world by first internally finding a sort of alignment and clarity and then walking with a shield and a sword. You, the sword is the awareness that holds self and the, uh, sorry, the shield is the awareness and the sword is the sense of self. So it's no longer we need physical violence, we need our minds. We need to, we need our minds to compensate for the violence. So in some sense, society, culture must be given complete freedom of behavior, but must have efficient ways to make sure this behavior is far from violence. So I want intense people uh, throughout the day, people who are living intensely, they're living, they're fully committed, their, their energy doesn't hold back for that action. Let's say when somebody tells you to do something you don't want to do, let's say you're, you're using 10% of your total energy because your free will is like, hey, man, I want to do what I want to do. Why is this person telling me to do that? Right? So, so subconsciously, you don't care about something that your mind has not concluded as an activity. Okay? 
<clears throat> this is why those people succeed in work who truly understand their work. They understand what the point of the whole institution is. Morality is for now being decided based on stories. So that means <clears throat> the secular, it's, it's kind of funny. Like when I see Jordan Peterson and Sam Harris talk, this is what I see. In their first discussion in Vancouver, which I felt it was a monumental moment for many, uh, for the educational system. Do you see it's like um, we are all playing a sort of Halloween costume in academia. You know, like it's Halloween and we're all dressing ourselves and cho choosing to have an allegiance to various banners, okay? Uh, but you can become a universal being. And this is a notion not inspired because the moment you do, your view on humanity will be different. You will kind of not only feel the heartbeat of your body, you will feel the heartbeat of every human being that has opened his eyes and has looked at the world and said there's something valuable here. You know, and it's very funny. We're all trying to find value outside of ourselves, not realizing it's this is it. It's the human species, and now it's the time of its great performance. For every person, the reason I say we're actors is uh, subjective actors in an objective realm, you know, because in some sense the final curtain will be pulled. I know that regardless of what I say, every step I am walking towards my grave. That is the nature of the, line of the linearity of time. But I find also that it's an opportunity. It's just a moment of phenomena, you know, because it's very interesting. I feel I kind of maintained this awareness is because I have memories of myself pre-thought, pre-language. Do you know? That means before thought, there's just present experience and a moment of attention. And then what occurs in this moment of attention becomes the meanings, definitions, symbols of the world. So anytime you start watching your intelligence, you update your, your mind. It's a sort of way the energies kind of flow. You know, your attention begins updating itself. Just like how in the Transformer movie, uh, the dude's car was like some lame car suddenly in the highway he notices a better car and transforms itself so your intelligence begins the more freedom it is given the more attempts at novel ways of living it will make so think of it this way if you are in a moment of suffering in a moment where you don't like the situation you're in okay think of it this way think of it this way you are now in a moment where so many others could have been in, but now you have an opportunity to find a new approach. That means I got bored of the normal, and then I got bored of the strange, and then I realized that worlds can be built in an instant. They are constantly being built in our minds. And what the mind is, is how the, we, are, we are this oscillating story of a person between consciousness and matter. There's moments where we feel we're a mind that is projecting a body into meaning and value and subjective se sensehood, selfhood. Uh, or there's moments where we feel we're just this physical entity that has a brain that's mysteriously producing this free will and it's, we're howling around to the mind. You know, it's, it's very funny. The way you choose to sit on the chair will suggest how comfortable you are, you know. Think of it this way. There was a school of fish, okay, and some of the students in the school of fish under the water, they suddenly, they were like, what is God? Okay, they started wondering about God, which to them was the ocean, which they did not know. They did not know how to even comprehend. And so all, the, all these fish, you know, educated fish from this school of fish, <laughs> go and find this wise fish, this older fish that was living, you know, at the edges of town, you know. And they find this wiser fish who se seems enlightened, this enlightened fish. And they say, enlightened fish. <laughs> tell, us, tell us what is God, okay? You know, and, or in some sense, one of the fish came to the enlightened sage and said, enlightened sage, tell me my future. 
an enlightened sage meditated the enlightened fish and said, you will be a filet fish <laughs> And in some sense, you know, the guy was like, what's a filet fish He's like, I do not know, you know. But, <laughs> but anyways, the notion is that they, all, they came and asked this older and wiser fish, what is God, what is truth? And the wiser fish said, God, whether you follow scripture or not, is in some sense, God is within you, outside of you, inside of you. God is holding the whole universe. You know, God is the ocean. And God is not a bigger fish. You don't have to go worship a whale, you know, just because you feel that the whale might know. It's like we're all in the same place where we all start uh, off uh, you, okay? We all have a new start in this world. When you realize the value of that, you will. it's up to you to find efficient ways to contribute to the world. The world can't ask you for help because the world doesn't have a mouth. Okay, the civilization is a collective phenomena. So it does. It, so if one part of it is not maintained, it is. It's like think of it this way: um, uh, when when people went and studied Rain Man's brain. Okay, I'll, I'll finish this fish story afterwards. <laughs> They recognize it's, it was as if if you could see a hole in the center of his brain, his his brain was kind of in a circular way working. So when this person's brain, a part of it didn't work, it's the brain began re reorganizing itself, restretching itself, and realigning itself. Okay. So, for example, there was a person named Daniel Talbot. And Daniel Talbot was some insane next-level intelligent guy who memorized the 10,000 digits after the point in pi, like 10,000 digits of pi, okay, the number, the, the pi ratio in mathematics. So this dude memorized this, and eight people sat in a room kind of like checking if he's correct or not. And he said all of it, and he was correct, and he finished, and all the human beings were like, holy shit, this guy's an alien. <laughs> But the notion was that the way he did it, he later on explained it in one of his books. And uh, the way he kind of explained it is, is that his mind was not remembering numbers. It wasn't like he was a robot remembering the digits, like one, three, blah, 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 like all the numbers, right? 3.14, like, you know, and it goes on. His mind was not remembering like that. In his mind, he was walking in a world where whenever there was something like a high tower, it was a number nine for him. When he looked at something that was short, it was like another number that had another meaning. So in some sense, how he memorized that 10,000 digits was he w moved in an environment that had 10,000 objects. He walked, he literally walked in a city and passed 10,000 stores, imagine, right? So his mind, in his mind, he was walking in a journey. He was conscious of the simul simulations of the mind, okay? Your mind constantly, based on the change of your biology, simul is constantly simulating itself as a character in wakefulness. When you study this, you have to come into a sort of contentment and it's instantaneous, just, I just, uh, it, this is, there's a Zen saying that says when you want to climb a, when you want to climb a mountain start at the top so what that means is if you want to live an efficient life just feel you are efficient just give it a try and see what it feels like to be efficient okay and efficient with your thoughts efficient not with just with organ external organization also with internal organization how how your own study of self has evolved your awareness Trust me, you, you, it, it's like um, it's kind of an inner journey that only you can take, uh, which means that when, I, when I'm Mr. Within's kind of telling guys, like this is the thing, I feel the world has teached all it can teach, and now the next teachings are only mirrors, as if the student, the student came to the master and said, Master, teach me something. And the master was like, student, I've teach you everything. There's nothing else to teach, you know? <laughs> But the student was like robotic. It's like, no, master, you must teach. You must teach me something else. And the, and the master was like, holy shit, what do I teach this kid? And the, <laughs> the master finds a mirror and looks at the kid and says, this is your last homework assignment, kid. And now you will understand what I'm teaching you. And the master gives the student a mirror. 
And the student's like, what is this? You know, and he's like, study yourself, god damn it. <laughs> so that's the next level. After your greatest external teaching, it's just left on to your own peculiar interest of how much you want to actually study how your intelligence is maintaining your world. And you might find ways and ways of perception you have it. And the way you maintain these is in three ways, guys. Which is you got to speak it, write it, or read. Okay? And I don't recommend just reading. I recommend reading your own writings for, to, to study your own style. Because in writing, they say just like as you, do, as you go through the 10,000 hours of writing, What occurs is that you eventually find your writer's voice. This writer's voice, it's not a writer's voice. It's just your own creative outlook on how phenomena is, is in position. And you, you suddenly have to, it's like, think of it this way. The artist shouldn't care what the world wants to see. This is my firm belief. You know why? Because why have limitations in a moment of art? Why have limitations when, where the whole point is to have a freedom of awareness to re-perceive re, uh, re the self? I found it very fascinating. When you see a lot of these, like, Britain's Got Talent, America's Got Talent kind of, that, like, these shows where dancers come in, you know, you see these dancing shows on TV, and you know what you see? You see pretty much people coming, and not even in dancing, just any sort of expressive artwork, uh, art form. Um, for example, the dancer dances and the singer sings, like even the rock star on that stage sings, and they find themselves in a moment where the inner experience cre aligns the emotion as if the emotional self of that being, the subjective self and the objective self of that being are in one alignment because they're in, in a sort of presence of the intelligence of the world. I have moments where I walk throughout the day, and especially when something intense and conflict-wise occurs. What I do is sometimes I walk, and even when I saw, like in downtown Toronto is uh, a, a tragedy and a comedy, okay? So what I mean by that is that uh, I've, I've kind of, like in downtown Toronto, I've walked, and I've just been outside the street, and I, see, I saw a person fall down in front of 10 Dundas, and this person was shaking, and there was some sort of, of course, drug, uh, homeless kind of situation going on. And this person was in that kind of situation, and security came and instantly, like, took him. Like, took him out in front of the building, so it was no longer security's problem. Okay, and I realized the coldness of social beings. We are not living as if we are in tribes. We're all, we're all lying to ourselves when our world is falling apart in front of us. You know, so in some sense, the idea of sin was just to make you conscious of the mistake. It was never something to linger too long. Guilt is not meant, you're not meant to feel guilty all the time. You, your guilt arises when you knew what was the right thing, but you didn't do it pretty much. Okay. And it's like, you got to get over your ignorance and choose to live a new life that is in alignment with the efficiency of your world. Or you're resisting the great river of civilization. You know? So it's as if, like, uh, a group of sheep, suddenly a line came up and shouted to all of them, Awaken! You know? And instantly there were no longer like a group of sheep, but there was a group of lions there. So instantly the mind can realign. Do you see the power of this? If I, if somebody is stressed and depressed, let's say it's, stress and depression is real, okay? Let's, uh, let's entertain the notion that stress and depression is real. So somebody has stress and depression. Now, if you ask that person, did, were you through your own free will choosing to be stressed or depressed or did it happen to you okay 
and the person will have to make a decision there. If they may, if they say, yeah, I was, I was being stressed. I was made like in that moment, my free will was choosing to be stressed and depressed. Okay. So if the person says it like that, you just have to seriously look at them and you're going to be like, Hey man, you're, you're choosing your, the levels of your stress and depression. So in some sense you're creating it. So how dare you say you're stressed or depressed when it's your own making? You see, so that it, there's a level of depression and stress that instantly wipes out the moment you're responsible for your consciousness, for your conscious being, okay? And then there's a level if the person says no, you know, it wasn't their free will, the world's cruel to them, they feel a victim of the world. If the, you find a person the victim of the world, you say, okay. You say, okay, and you sympathize and you're like, yeah, I could totally see how you're a victim of how life happened to you, but I have a question. And you say this very gently and gracefully, no longer with a serious attitude, in a playful way you say to the person. So now that you're a victim, what is the next thing you can do? And you'll see it has to do with how long you choose to entertain an efficient idea until you get bored with it. Trust me, it's, it's, it's kind of sometimes when you choose to be weak, choose to see yourself as weak, it's like a child playing with a toy. You know, you're, you haven't understood how the world wants you to live for it. It requires the real you. This is why uh, Alan Watts, he's a man who... I find him to have found access to a great contentment with the world. That means like seldom do we realize that we are being the world. We're being a design in the intelligence of the world. In some sense, how we live is God's memories, if you're, if you're of the religious intent. The older fish says to the younger fish, the ocean is the moment, and that's it. And the younger fish are like, the educated fish are like, that's too simple of an answer, man. We can't just accept that. Say something a bit more complex, you know? And then the older fish says, anything I say that's complex is not going to make you realize that this truth you're seeking is everywhere. It's as if the eyes of the world are open and we are the pupil of the eye of the world. The third eye is not your third eye. You're not like some, you don't have a physically third eye. Your third eye is, how, is your mind's sight. And your mind's sight is, is objective inspired, but it will, it will also has an ability. The way the mind can move is that you become the thoughts. And how you become the thoughts is with your attention being still. So your physical body, the more still it is, your mind's more moving. When the more your bo physical body moves, your body's moving and your mind doesn't have time. That means that the energy of your being is more going to a physical maintenance of existence rather than uh, towards an objective maintenance of existence rather than a subjective one. So in some sense, this is what Mr. Within is saying. I'm going to get to the juice of the talk, you know? <laughs> you know, when life gives you lemons, do you know what do you do? You give that, those lemons to the, those who don't have lemons. Anything in your life that you feel there could be another intelligent human being that could use, you should share. That's the kind of, one of Mr. Within's kind of graceful commands to the living world. You got to live for life for, in order for this t system to be empowered. And if we fail, if let's say right now, regardless of uh, what happens or not, after this current moment, well, let me say the exact date, July 1st, 2019, on a Monday, If from this moment on, all the decisions of the, our civilization lead to inefficiency and we bring our extinction or the death of our extinction, and not the death of our extinction, but the death of humanity, if this, arise, if this occurs, then 
my my res resolve to that situation is that we must just look at the future generations and tell them don't try to save the past that is lost in its mistakes. We have to sacrifice inefficiency in order for the future generations. And if we are living it inefficiently, so what can what like? Do you see what I mean? We have to care. And we shouldn't be blind, we should have tolerance. Tolerance is so important because, you see, this is what I noticed. Imagine all those people uh, who buy self-help books, okay? They say the self-help bo book industry is a billion-dollar kind of industry. And I was like, what the fuck? <laughs> People are choosing through their free will and consciousness to decide to purchase, for example, a product that is going to tell them something about themselves. But my view, my view is that there is nothing greater when your experience consciously begins moving life. When your body moves, not because you have to, not because of a schedule, because you're living life. It's like every moment has the supreme value of being one of your memories. How you hold yourself, how you stand, how you sit, how you hold your ideas, how you hold your mind, how tolerant you are, how universally responsible you are. We have to recognize it's as if like I am waiting for the next school of Athens to begin. School of Athens 2.0, I call it. This, is, this was my vision of not creating a school, but creating this kind of library dash, you know, kind of uh, debate hall, grand debate hall, where all the greatest ideas come for, uh, ready to combat. It's as if like we saw robot wars, now we're seeing idea wars. And we, in some sense, our entertainment becomes our intelligence, not something that makes us not intelligent. And this is why there is, in, in the entertainment industry, this, my, my personal philosophy on um, uh, acting, let's say, is that those actors who are acting from an honest place within themselves are way more valuable, way more valuable than actors that are trying to do the right thing. Okay, sometimes being the right way is more important than doing the right thing. You know, because you won't get access to the right thing. Your, yourself has to uh, acknowledge that you're here to live your life. And a lot of children who have idols and anybody who has a poster, you know, I, I recommend if you really want a poster of, on, on your wall, put a poster of your own face, you know. <laughs> let, 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 do, first idolize yourself because idolizing yourself is better than idolizing somebody outside of you. But after you've idolized yourself, I'm saying something better than idolizing yourself is also not idolizing yourself. Eventually you're like, if I don't imagine to you tell the religious guy, he's like, if I don't worship others and if I don't worship myself, who do I worship? And they said, worship the unknown source of all existence, okay? And th that statement is one of those situations where you're like, okay, eventually it comes to how the moment is present. So truth comes to how you're being present right now. Observe your intelligence. Start studying it. This is kind of like a side project I'm kind of assigning to everybody who listens to this. Start your great work. Go buy like at least five notebooks, okay? And actual notebooks, because I recommend everybody who's a fan of these Mr. Within Talks, you better start writing. Because there is a reason your eyes are open. And there's a reason there's free will. Because life wants you to authentically choose how you live. So, regardless of the decisions made... Any person who seeks efficient vision and the depth of those words, efficient vision, will you will it doesn't matter. Don't don't think of the reward. You will eventually find enough efficiency for for something great to happen. Okay, because we don't want some an attempt of greatness to be inefficient. That's the way biggest waste of time. 
as if you're trying to make the world a better place, but then the better place the world becomes is not even better, you know? So it's like, it's kind of complicated because our attempts at bringing clarity will bring greater forces of disruptance. In one manner, we all want to unite and bring this sort of peacefulness and global freedom of mind. And uh, on another level, the more united we become, the more the groups become stronger and bigger. If they disagree, the bigger the fights will become. You know, so, so in some sense, the more people love their nation, the more they actually fought for their nation, okay? And so now I'm saying eventually the fights will end because what we're calling nations is pretty much colors on a, uh, on a globe, okay? Colors on a sphere. We're fighting over color. Do you, do you believe that? And it's, it's, it's crazy. Sometimes it's incredibly strange how um, people feel like they can judge another uh, like, uh, okay, let me not get into this. But anyways, we have to preserve, like think of it this way, a very honorable act on this in this planet was to maintain technologies that were on the brink of being lost. Okay, so one aspect of one's great work must include uh, a, a sort of compiling effort. You have to try to maintain history and you have to seek truth enough to find more and more uh, of, of a, a polished kind of view on life. You have to begin cultivating your intelligence. You got to embrace how your brain has two hemispheres. Like, did you know the left hemisphere of your brain is, 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 seems to be in charge of the right side of your body? And the right hemisphere of the brain seems to be inspired by the left. And we feel the left side of the brain is analytical. We feel the right is side is creative. What does that imply? And we look at the brain and we see primarily it's the frontal lobe area when one is analyzing something that's being lit up. So in some sense, we're kind of wondering what's occurring with our mind. How is our mind designed? And we see these two creative freedoms is that a part of you is seeking ever continuity and a part of, part of you is con seeing the edge of the discontinuous. So you are in some sense a part of you is being nothing and something at the same time and that's why I say our consciousness is oscillating between existence and non-existence in the same way that we are blinking all the time okay when we blink what happens like your your brain is like holy shit the world's no longer there you know but suddenly it your eyes open and you see the world and so when you're talking to somebody, you never wonder about how many blinks you're doing. And so, but eventually you see it's like it's a lot because it has come into the process of nature. So nature kind of sleeps and wakes up, sleeps, wakes up, sleeps, wakes up. Now we in our waking state have an opportunity to contribute. And the next levels of our contribution must be intellectually inspired. That means I am asking the world to pay attention to at least creating a system where the greatest ideas can find a stage. You know how many people on this planet uh, could have an idea that could change the world if it was just shared? And it honestly depends on the decency of the being. Decency or your honor of self. If you don't honor yourself, it's kind of the ancient mystic said you would have perversions of your mind. So what does that mean? That means like the moment you don't care about yourself, you, you, your mind feels it can be anything. You could be a devil or you could be an angel or you could be whatever. Okay, when you stop caring about direct experience and you stop caring about how intelligence is present, you become, you believe yourself in mold and into any container. You know, somebody could come and tell you you're a dragon and you'll be like, holy shit, I am a dragon. Like, do you see, you'll, you, you'll be gullible You will be gullible to you will be gullible to your mind in some sense. So I constantly think that in order to have an efficient civilization, 
in order to create the greatest environment for the future generations to open their eyes in, the most efficient one, we have to create for the value of efficiency and we have to put it above everything else. And efficiency means collective freedom. It means if all human beings, if, if humanity was seen as one being, how, what kind of mind would it have? It would have a mind where it is granting all of itself freedom, where it is granting every moment an ability to advance, to evolve, because in the efforts of evolution and in the collective integrative rhythmic movements of our evolutionary expression, we are going to find that we are going to be creating, in some sense, inner technologies. And that will become fascinating because, when, for example, somebody who's uh, animating, let's say, in some sort of software, like is creating a 3D animation of something, thoughts are in some sense moving uh, the keyboard and the mouse. In some sense, this person is, is allowing an inner phenomena to fun, finally find an objective phenomena, you know, have an objective form. Okay, so there's ways that you are making the world real to yourself, and there's the ways that the world is making you real. Okay, you know, that means a part of your intelligence has to do with what the world, how the world is happening to for you and to you and a part of you has it with how you are happening to the world how you contain value meaning structure whatever but do not fear emptiness do not fear fear you know the death of fear was the birth of truth I consider this new human being will not be actually a new human being. It will be a person for the first time acknowledging themselves as an advanced communicator. The advanced communicator, this is a term I've created to, to see, I see us as 8 billion adva advanced communicators. Like for me, it's like we are not just the homo sapien. We are the communication of the homo sapien as well. We are the expression of its full potential. So where potential energy in society is the kinetic side. Regardless of the landscape that dwells behind your eyes, what kind of proof can you get from divinity when all that is here is a moment of aware existence? This awareness that you are conscious of a world and you're conscious of the self, that is incredibly an advanced position for an animal to be in. So we, you are in some sense an animal with a potential that no other species on this planet has. So this potential has to be driven somewhere. Okay, so you are you are like a I don't want to say a packet of energy, but you are you are like a you you are an energetic force. This energetic force is being steered by your attention, and it, this energetic force, wherever your attentions go, wherever your attention goes, thoughts flow. If your attention goes on a cup, you suddenly get thoughts on the cup. Oh my God, is the cup half full, half empty? What color is it? Does it matter what color the cup is? Like, <laughs> do you see, for me, it's, it's like the mind can play many games with it. And when there is a lack of responsibility, there suddenly comes a, a, an openness to play any game. And, not, and we are a species that has no time to make any more mistakes. And the way it fixes its mistakes by actually looking at them. So we have to start caring uh, for anything that we can see that could function in a better way. Okay, so for me, it's not that we, 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 we have to stop eating animals because that's the good thing to do. That's the right thing to do. It's because in some sense, we have to ask ourselves, uh, what is the efficient route, you know? And we have to kind of see, for example, if we stop eating animals, where's the, amb the, in the incredible vastness of our culinary arts going to go, you know? <laughs> so in some sense, our, our, culin our gastronomy, our culinary sectors will have will not exist so in some sense i believe actually the world can never go that way actually but anyways the notion is that we wonder about the efficient path and that's just the duty of your lifetime wonder about how this vision is here and how it's going to experience what is here
and become kind of like a scribe of your own mind. Become a scribe of your direct experience of life. The moral inspirations of future generations begin in how not only they hold their vision, but in what light they choose to see their ancestors in. And I will tell this, hopefully, if my voice echoes that long, let's say for 10,000 years from now, if, if some of my talks continue, if this sentence I'm going to say continues, I'm going to tell the children of the future generations in some sense, human beings, in, we thought what it would be like 10,000 years ahead of our time. There have been people on this planet who have done this. And as their minds have wandered towards that direction, it's as if what is left to say to our future generations is to see ahead without forgetting where they are. And that is the only result. Your eyes have to open uh, to a new ability, and which means you have to see a new sense of self that is able from, from the beginning is able. You see, sometimes you can't change the past. you got to let go of the past. You know, there's been moments where I, I was shy and I couldn't speak and I, I, I was trying to avoid society at all costs. Like I went into that state of mind when I was like, I don't know, like 15 or something. For me, society, I didn't even care for it. I just wanted to be in my own space. But um, I came to understand this is the only game left to play. No longer just the, adva the advancement of your own eyes, but the advancement of the eyes of your world. That's the priority. We have to care for what is here, or it won't evolve. Now, the moral inspirations can be... Uh, um, every person can choose to see a blueprint out of that major idea that we, we are alive to see how far we can go, how far the exploration continues. And the greatest effort we have is because we, we have minds and intelligence in that way, we have to begin honoring and being really fascinated by how our minds move, which means how communication is occurring on a global level and how efficient this communication is, how direct and honest it is, how clear it is. And as the communication of the uh, globe becomes much more efficient, because there, eventually there will come states of mind, states of creative innovation, where in, in as it's like we recognize the opportunity of cost of violence was that gentle space where many geniuses would suddenly allow their innovation to, uh, to in some sense be expressed. That means we are choosing not to be violent, not because it's more, it's what God wants or it's the right thing or wrong thing. We're choosing to not be violent, so there is an opportunity for the mind's intelligence to expand. You see, it's a it's a sort of we give freedom to our attention first, then our body. That means the person is a slave because they still think of they are the thought of a slave. They have not understood the depth of their experience. Your freedom relies on how your eyes open up to the world. Which means if I ask you where is your thoughts, you'll be my thoughts are right here. And if I ask you where is the thought of God, and if I ask you where is the thought of no God, where is the belief, where is the disbelief, where is all ideology right now, it is in the present moment. You see, it's not me who's just talking in front of a stage. The world is all, all of the, the world is here. Some sort of intelligence is here, you know? <clears throat> Anyways. <laughs> Guys, I'm, I'm on my porch. It's getting a bit cold. Um, thanks for tuning in. Uh, I feel like I should share one more story before I go. And I'm going to share the story of, uh, in some sense, I think it, it, it would relate to a social, to a certain social context. But um, uh, the story is of these two lovers, okay? 
and this woman let's say who in some sense is blind and she has a boyfriend who she's never seen you know and so one day suddenly in the context of the story there comes this uh, thing where they say they found eyes for her and now she can see okay and this girl suddenly opens her eyes and she sees her boyfriend has become blind and they get shocked you know and the girl says oh my god you're blind i don't want this and the girl breaks up with the guy right on the spot the moment she can see and the guy loves this girl to such a point which is strange his reaction his friends would call him a fool but he what he says is is he says take care of my eyes dear and he leaves And it's like that moment where you figure out in the story the dude loved the girl so much where he loved like her soul, so he allowed her soul to see, so he sacrificed his own eyes. I don't know, it's a story I read online, you know. <laughs> but the notion was that sometimes that will really be like the peak of honor. They're, they're people were not perfect creatures, so there will be many imperfect observations of human beings of one another okay this imperfection there must be a tolerance but there must be also an instant recalibration that means if you're running a company imagine okay and imagine this is like just like how somebody runs a company they're running their thoughts okay <laughs> And uh, this person who's running a company, the moment he sees a problem in some department of the company, that problem, the sooner it is fixed, the better the result. Okay? So problems in life must be instantly tackled. Instantly. Because the more it lingers, the more the inefficiency continues in the whole system. So to be honest, uh, I believe it was Benjamin Franklin who said, honesty is the first chapter in the book of wisdom. I, I don't know if it was George Washington who said this or Benjamin Franklin. But honesty is the first chapter in the book of wisdom. That means before you do anything in this life, like before you like, you know, cut vegetables, let's say for dinner, <laughs> you wash your hands, okay? And then you cut. So in some sense when you want to approach the world subjectively, you clear your mind first. In meditation, they suggested you sit still and silent somewhere. And prefer, I, prefer, I prefer, like they, you know, they would say in nature, okay. So you, because you want to understand the nature of your being, do not be avoid the natural world. Try to comprehend its magnificence, and it will protect your eyes. Beauty is is your brain giving off waves in a certain way. When somebody sees nature beautiful. It's as if all the entities that come around that person will not feel threatened. They will feel surprised. They would feel graceful. They would realize that the value of existence is in how we respond to it, how we choose to see it. And trust me, it's not that the, the internet set us free. The internet set man's mind, allowed man's mind to access a database of so many various viewpoints on earth that it's as if my ancestors, uh, you know, died in their grave wondering if there would ever be such a thing. Children is is a phase childhood is a phase of life that every living being experiences and when you're a child you have you start off like with this blank slate of a mind and you kind of go into the world and then as you experience situations as your and as your free will constantly moves the child eventually individualizes itself as the parents call the child's name the child suddenly becomes what it is okay becomes the name that it's given Okay, and suddenly there comes a sort of subjective statue making of your identity behind your eyes. Okay, this statue making is actually done from memories. You're using in influences, imagery uh, from, uh, from your memories, tangible, objective, relatable imagery. And you're also using subjective, abstract imagery. And your mind begins to contain the self. So your self is made from the known and the unknown. The unknown is endless, infinite, dynamic creativity.
activity um, uh, the the known is fine uh, how can I say it it's like the known is kind of finite torch passing kind of intelligence you know that means civilization is just a continuity of efficiency and freedom must be valued above all. So in some sense, children, it must be a crime to disturb a child's uh, environment. Okay, I feel children, because we all start off in that state, it's a state vulnerable to being conditioned too soon. So how does a child grow in a world where so many waves of data and ideology are hitting it? How does this child continue in this world uh, where suffering is kind of thrown at its face? Okay, so this child must choose to stabilize its attention and it must choose to the best advice children could be given is live honestly and be aware. Be aware of the world around you because that is the journey of life. Your awareness eventually evolves regardless if you're a child if you're, or if you're an old man. You know, your, your awareness is constantly evolving. It's like whether you like it or not, whether you have a good conversation, bad conversation, it, things are changing. The value of this change is, is the will. Your free will, if you never did anything, you wouldn't even know you have free will. But because you move, because there's dynamic intelligence, this intelligence is ascribed into the position of the conceptual position of a free will. There's more to life than just stuff and language. The world is an incredible place. And the journey of a lifetime is how life and time are applying to us in a, for, in, for a certain period, you know? It's like I, I was very fascinated when I was younger. I had this view, oh my God, just like I have thoughts that's come out of nowhere as if the world is God's thoughts, you know? And it's, it's just like how thoughts don't linger in my mind all the time, it's as if just like people don't live on the planet, immortality is not there. You know, I hope this talk has served you and, um, An enlightened sage once said to a student that was ready to hear this, these words, a student who actually, uh, what, like, the story is, like, this student goes to this enlightened guy, the enlightened guy doesn't speak at all, the student lingers around and constantly asks this guy, the student gets angry, sad, and constantly says, hey, man, tell me the truth, tell me the truth, this guy's just sitting quietly on his porch. You know, and so the kid suddenly sits there for a while too, and eventually he doesn't talk, and it's like thin, things are just silent moment. And one day he gets so irritated that he says to the enlightened guy, "What is this man? I've been here so long. Why aren't you uh, spilling the beans? Why aren't you telling me what truth is? Okay, you're, you, this is ridiculous. I'm leaving. You don't even care. You know." And so the guy leaves, and as he leaves, he suddenly gets this feeling. Like, as he's made his way, like, he's about to completely leave this, this guy's place. He, like, he's, he's walking back to the town. He suddenly gets this feeling like, shit, okay, maybe I should go back. This is a story I kind of read that I'm sharing. And uh, so what happens is that this guy goes. He goes and um, suddenly sees that uh, he goes to the master who hasn't been spoken and said this in light guy who hasn't said anything. And then light guy sees him and says, why this ceaseless coming and going? Why the ceaseless coming and going? You see, the search for the true self, the ultimate response to it is why the ceaseless coming and going. The future generations require efficient vision. That's their only task. 
much blessings and namaste.